60s, you had a huge influx of Puerto Rican migrants to the United States. I was born in East Harlem, and I grew up in the South Bronx in a Puerto Rican community. People played stickball in the summers, snowball fights in the winters. But the Puerto Ricans, even though they were U.S. citizens, were not considered Americans. They were considered foreigners. You had white store owners. You had white landlords, along with uh, white police. White gangs, Jewish and Italian, would at random attack Puerto Ricans and sometimes families that were walking together. We knew when to go home. We were the sons and daughters of this huge displacement of poor people. We had seen their suffering and the discrimination. And we ourselves had lived it as the next generation. Puerto Ricans not only migrate into the United States, they migrated into the civil rights movement. My senior year in college, Martin Luther King was assassinated. There were riots in 125 cities in the week after Martin Luther King was killed. Not one, not two, 125 cities in the United States had riots. Who was dying in the Vietnam War? Who was going hungry? You can't trust the government. They're gonna kill you. National movements in this country began to rise in a way that had never happened. You couldn't be living during that period of time and not be impacted by the Black Panther Party. The primary objective of the Panther Party is to establish revolutionary political power for black people. We want freedom, the power to determine the destiny of our own community. Even though I was born in Puerto Rico, most of us were born here and we weren't gonna take the kind of abuse that they were heaping on our parents. We were gonna insist on respect. <laughs> I was approached by Mickey Melendez. He had grown up in East Harlem and he played baseball with my two cousins. So gradually we started meeting, trying to figure out what we could do to improve the situation of the Puerto Rican community. One of the things that we do all the time was read the Black Panther paper. And there was this announcement of the Puerto Rican organization there, and it was called the Young Lords. We met with one of the leaders of the Young Lords in Chicago, Jose Chacha Jimenez. And he gave us the go ahead to start the East Coast wing of the Young Lords. <laughs> Welcome, welcome once again to the Radical Imagination. I'm your host, Jim Vredos, and I'm a sociologist who's taught at John Jay College and Yeshiva University here in New York City. Over 50 years ago, in July of 1970, the Young Lords, a revolutionary community group of Hispanic and Black New Yorkers, occupied Lincoln Hospital in the Bronx for 12 hours. Long known as a butcher shop, they demanded better care, improved conditions, and a variety of patient and worker rights for the community of color that Lincoln served and employed. The Lords demanded a people's hospital, where among other things, healthcare would be free. They became outspoken critics of diseases of poverty, environmental and structural racism, the way communities of color were disproportionately exposed to harmful environmental conditions. They were incredibly young. Their membership ranged from 14 to early 30s, and they defined themselves as a revolutionary political party fighting for the liberation of all oppressed people. Headquartered in East Harlem and inspired by the Black Panthers, 
The New York branch existed from 1969 to 1976. Their use of the Puerto Rican flag and the phrase, I have Puerto Rico in my heart, made them Puerto Rican nationalists who supported independence for the island and self-determination for Puerto Ricans and all people of color on the mainland. In the midst of a global pandemic, the legacy and lessons of the young lords remain fresh and young. It lives on in the creative community-based health activism and struggles flourishing today in New York City. As Bob Dylan put it, he might as well have been writing and singing about the young lords. May you grow up to be righteous. May you grow up to be true. May you always be courageous, stand upright and be strong. May your heart always be joyful. May your song always be sung. And may you stay forever young. Felipe Luciano is an Afro-Puerto Rican American activist, a musicologist, co-founder of The Last Poets, and the New York chapter of the Young Lords, where he was elected chairman. He was the first Puerto Rican news anchor of a major media network station in the United States and won two Emmy Awards for his journalism. He recently earned a master's degree in Christian social justice from Union Theological Seminary, where we met several years ago in the catacombs of Union. So you are welcome, Philippe. You remember that day? Remember? I remember that day like it was yesterday, Jenny. It it was. We were we were forever young then too. And I I turned a corner in the catacombs, and I don't know. There you were, studying something or other, and we got into a conversation, and you started using all sorts of you know, you were speaking in Yiddish and Greek and <laughs> I don't know Russian, everything. I said you knew. You know more more about Yiddish and and, uh, and and Jewish life than I did, and, and so on. But anyway, listen, it is such a joy and blessing. I am so glad to see you again. It's been a little while. I'm so glad you're here, and and so uh, let's let's get into it. Let's talk about what you're doing today, and let, let's start with what was going on there, in, as you took over Lincoln Hospital. It was. 1970. Yep. We had been in existence a year. Uh, our offensive, that is, our thrust was health. I never thought that I'd be involved in a health movement. I wanted armed struggle. My whole being yearned for it. Armed yeah. struggle. Armed arm struggle. struggle. Hmm. My whole DNA is geared to that of warriorhood. Hmm. Little did I know that I was going past the people. When we ask the elders in the community, what do you need? What is the injustice that you're suffering right now? They told me garbage. I, I, I was in shock. I wanted to quit right there. Garbage. Only later did I understand what they were really saying. Garbage creates sickness, sickness creates hospital, hospitals creates time off from work or death. We need you to pick up this garbage. So we started with that health. Then we went into the TB truck modality. We found out that a lot of the people uh, were suffering from lung infections, some of them tubercul uh, tuberculosis. We noticed that the TB trucks that they were dispensing throughout the city were not coming to our communities. So we kidnapped the TV truck, did that. Uh, it was a hit. By the time the police got to our block, there were literally, there were a hundred or more people waiting to be examined and x-rayed. Uh, we did um, lead paint testing, lead poison, lead paint poison. We found out a lot of people were affected by that. Of course, we had already done the People's Church in which we provided nutritious breakfast for kids who were suffering. They weren't doing well uh, in classroom. You know, the high for Puerto Ricans or any other uh, Caribbean people uh, is the sugar. So when you send a child to school, you usually send them with a little roll and a cup of coffee, strong coffee. So the kids had a sugar high 
And then <laughs> around 10.30, they were like this. Hmm. And they weren't studying very well and they weren't uh, achieving their greatest potential. So we were into health. We heard that a woman had died on the operating table uh, from a, tri, uh, a trimester abortion. She had tried to get a late abortion and she died. We realized, we didn't know exactly what the details were, but we knew that this was our time to move. History is determined by moments. Um, it is some, yes, it is a long ribbon of progression, a long ribbon of struggle, but one moment can make the difference. We decided that that moment that we were going to attack Lincoln. Now, I was against it. You were against what? You were against a take over? I had no problem taking over a hospital. I didn't think Lincoln was the one. I thought, really? yeah, thinking as a military commander, where can we have the advantage of space, food, water, and support from the community? Logistics. That's how you think when you're, when you're, when you're at war. Right. Lincoln was too far, believe it or not. I said, it's too far for us to, uh, uh, to supply you with food and support. I was outvoted, thank God. Yeah, you were and wrong on that, I guess. I was wrong on that. And they said, let's go to Lincoln. But what, what would have been the other options? Uh, Sideman Hospital? Was the other, yeah, no, the other options were so, Mount Sinai. Mount Sinai? Mount Sinai? Interesting. Right here. But, Metropolitan. But Lincoln, Metropolitan Lincoln. was right here. But Metropolitan had, right. a Metropolitan. Decent, had a decent um, history. Wasn't great, but it was decent. Uh, Mount Sinai was a voluntary hospital. And we would have received so much criticism from the uh, liberal community and from our own community that we were hurting a hospital and we would have received bad press, which I didn't care about. Uh, Mount Sinai had its own uh, subtle, insidious racism and I felt that we should attack it. Absolutely, but Felipe, can I, can I just get, can we move back here? We're actually talking about Mount Sinai here. Can we go back a few couple of steps? You, your mother, was Pentecostal, right? Yes, she was. And so you were raised in that environment. You also, in your bio mentioned, you studied with an Ethel Shapiro, which she one of your teachers or? All of my, all of my teachers growing up were Ashkenazi. They were Jews. Jews, and so you- Some of them were um, children or, um, yeah, children of Holocaust- House survivors. Folks. Um, Ethel saw her entire family demolished in Poland. I'll never forget when she took me in the back room of junior high school 263. And she was discussing with me why it was important to have compassion. I loved her, I adored her. And she was the one who gave me an incredible desire um, to excel in academia. Um, she, she knew I was in games. She would stop me very often when I was having fights and she would say, why, why are you hurting this guy? I'm saying, because he deserves to be, he, he insulted my gang. And she would lift, lift me up off the guy's sternum. And the guy, she said, get off the sternum. And, and the guy was, I'm punching him. The guy would say, what's a sternum? And I said, shut up. Cause she was such an incredible lady with me. Um, we, were, we were taught Shakespeare, Steinbeck, um, Hemingway, Isaac Bashevis singer, um, you name it. So the uh, prophetic, Prophetic Jewish tradition yes. came down through her to you. Now, you didn't pick up this arm or did this arm struggle stuff from the Pentecostal. Uh, no, no, not at all. I picked it up. I picked it up from change? Jewish Americans, from Jewish Americans Just and Black Americans. Jewish. To, okay, go ahead. Go ahead. Remember, the '60s was a was a year of tumult. Uh, people were were going to the arms. Paris had blown up. Uh, Mexico City had been destroyed almost. Uh, they killed about 300 students there, the government. Um, Japan was breaking. Um, Kent, there were so many things happening. Malcolm had been killed. Right. Uh, Kennedy, I mean, we, we had seen the horrible result of brutal violence against people, against people of, of vision. Right. Anyway, so I grew up, I grew up, then there was Mr. Bender, the music teacher in 263, who taught us uh, uh, young pioneer songs. Um, because the state of Israel, he was still very much involved in El Yivne Hagalil, El Yivne Hagalil, Baruch Yivne Hagalil, Baruch Yivne. So I grew up with all of these Jewish songs, Jewish expressions, right? And grew up loving the culture. I always tell people before you criticize, do not criticizing the nation is one thing. 
demeaning, degrading, and humiliating the people is quite another. You can talk about Trump all you want. I was against Netanyahu and still am. I'm against the government of Israel because I think it's crazy sometimes. The Knesset, the, the right. Likud party has taken over for too long. But I can never criticize Israel. I can never criticize Jews. I mean, that's incredible. Oh, wait, Why wait, would you criticize I, the people? I know we're, we're, we're going to get back to you know the hospital and, and so on, but we're digressing. We're, it's not a digression, but what about Zionism? Because there is a huge dialogue. It was, it's, yeah. a, it's also a very, uh, it rips the, the left apart too in terms of, so I get it. They criticize the government and so on. But what about Zionism? Does when Zionism, have the right to when, exist? Zionism when Zionism is used um, to oppress people, that is, I can understand the need to establish a national identity. I understand that. You understand that. Yeah. I understand the need to say we are Jewish, uh, we belong to a people, we have a tradition, we have prophets, and we have a vision. But when you take that vision um, and secularize it to the point where you forget about Hashem, you forget about God, you forget about the spirit, and what you do is oppress people who are nearby by saying to them, you don't belong here. No, we I get that, I get that, but, but Felipe, should there so be Zionism, Zionism has been state, should there be a state in some form at this point maybe well, the, a state well, of Israel uh, remember that states. when they were running when they were looking for a state after World War II they looked at all kinds of places they looked at the north part of North America they looked at um, uh, South America they looked at other places to see if they, we could do Africa they Israel was the one they chose. It probably was the one they could probably easier, uh, easily take. Um, the British were in control of it. But, but, but um, Felipe, they had the historical background. You, you they here, had an incredible historical background. But that's, yeah, but that's no reason. That's no reason to say because you had a historical background, you belong there. They are, but there is. But what happened is that it, yeah, it ended up in Israel. Now, All right. the people who were there were unceremoniously moved out. And we can say, no, we offered the money. We, we know that there were, there were people who were so intent on moving the Arabs out um, that they committed, I think, quite a few crimes. Now, is that a reason for Israel to move now? Is that a reason to say Israel should not be there? No, it is there. And I say, I will always defend its right to be there. You, I, I, would, I, I could get mad at some of the policies of right. Israel, but I'm, I can't, I'm not going to say they have to move. If that's the case, why don't we tell the Americans here, move from the United States and let the Native Americans take over? Come on. I got let's, it. Let's be serious. Let, 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 let's approach it this way, Felipe. We're, we were dealing, we're dealing with traumatized peoples, as you point out. Yes. Many, not all, of course, survivors of the Holocaust. You understand that. How do we bring about, how do we end this cycle of violence? The Palestinians themselves were traumatized. Yes, they were. As, as, as victims of, of, of uh, colonialism. Here's the problem. So, and, 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 getting back, and getting back to that, I, I wish I was in the studio with We're you. We're going to talk about that with respect to... And your trauma. And your trauma, too, yes. growing up. So tie that in together for, with us. Understand that the trauma of violence right. affects even the DNA. Right. The right. trauma of violence affects you for centuries. Why do you think we have as much dysfunction in the black community as we have today? Why do you think we have much, as much dysfunction in the Puerto Rican community? Do you think for one second that the Spaniards come into Puerto Rico, slicing people in half with yes. their steel swords, raping the chief's wife, making uh, Native Americans, they were slaves in their own country and making them work in gold mines, which for 400 years for for four, do you think that goes away easy do you think branding a man's testicles setting him afloat uh and and burning him do you think um a raping black women this does not go away there be we become dysfunctional and i think america should get on its knees and thank black people for not having become nihilists for not having become sociopaths Right. Because right. that can easily drive you into mental illness, and we have enough of it as it is. Right. But the, the greatest love in the world that I've ever seen is to see Black people still forgiving, to see people of color still forgiving, considering the European expansion and colonialism and imperialism. Absolutely. What they went through is horrible, horrible. 
And we'll talk about that in a little, particularly in the Caribbean. Absolutely. Radical love. Cornell Radical love. love. And I think the way to get rid of it is to constantly become uh, an agent of change, an agent of love. Now, it's now, but, but, but to say that is hard. It took me a long time to say that. That's what I was going to say. Believe, you, you, I believe sometimes you have to punch somebody in the face. However, well, I know you do. <laughs> I now am a father of three. I'm a grandfather of two. And I realize that hurt people hurt people. It's as simple as that. B talks about it all the time. You've got to be able to love and in spite of what you see happening, that is the greatest guy, the greatest revolutionary I've ever, I've ever seen. Let me give you an example. I have a friend named Ronnie Van Cleef. He's a master, uh, five times uh, world champion, 15 times American champion in karate. Uh, and I brought him over to uh, a school in the Bronx, tough school, there's a lot of gang activity. And he began to teach martial arts. Some of the gangs didn't like it because their girlfriends were going to the class and they didn't like their girls developing independent skills and all of that malarkey. Um, one of the guys was, who was a member of the gang, uh, who was taking the course because he really wanted to, um, was told by, uh, his name is Ronnie Van Cleve, was told by uh, Shidoshi, that's the, that's the official title, he's a high ranking guy. Mm -hmm. uh, look, you gotta take care, you can't act up in class. The guy spit in his face. Now, I'm gonna tell you right now, Ron Van Cleef could kill you in two and a half seconds. Mm. That's how long it takes to break your neck, yeah. all it takes. Mm. He looked at the guy, he told him, thank you. The kid was aghast, didn't know what to say. That's, and the kid eventually calmed down. What I'm saying is that at the risk of sounding kumbayaish, at the risk of sounding Christ-like, at the risk of sounding Christian, if you will, but I think this is a universal principle. Ms. Shapiro taught it to me, and she was Jewish American. Love does have an effect on the soul. It does. She loved me into wanting to learn. She loved me into saying, this is what you have to do. She wanted me to become a teacher, I think. I, and so did, so did uh, uh, Saul, Saul Resnick from Queens College. So did Joan Meinhardt. All of the Jewish Americans I met who, who goaded me into success, goaded me into doing something real, not something materialistic, but something that serves. So to this day, I, I really believe that sometimes the best thing, the best thing to do is just hug. Great. Well, you are a teacher, I, but this transformation, this gradual transformation as this kid who was into armed struggle here coming head to head with a struggle. Yeah. How did that take over transform you? And how did you, this action, and Juan Gonzalez was, of course, involved, and he said, things wouldn't have happened today had you not done what you did then. That's right. So the transformation, and and man, now what's, this took chutzpah, chutzpah plus, and I don't know what the Yiddish term would be. I don't know what it would be in Spanish. But you guys and, and women all had so much of this, and... I mean, it's beyond this. This, this uh, documentary, this takeover, it's called Takeover by Emma Francis Snyder, is an unbelievable documentary, uh, showing in actual footage the takeover, the planning, and what happened, and the police coming, and so on, and the acts of courage, and 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 so on that you had to to uh, that you were experiencing, that you had to formulate here on the run here, and the the smartness that was needed, and so on. Anyway, what is Tell us more about your own personal transformation and how this action was so important in your own development and the development of the community. One of the things that the institutions of this city underestimated was our intelligence. Mm -hmm. We have uh, the Central Committee at that time had five of the brightest Puerto Ricans in New York City. Juan Gonzalez, graduate or no, no, a student at Columbia University, Yep. Pablo Uribe Guzman, who had graduated from uh, Bronx High School of Science. Um, David Perez, who was attending uh, the University of Old Westbury. Um, uh, Juan Fiotis, who um, was a major liaison between the gangs um, in East Harlem and me. Um, so, and I had just come out of jail and I was full of um, vim and vigor, shall we say. Now, I... They underestimated us. They thought that we could not think on the run. Uh, and the most important part of organizing, the most important part of being 
um, a revolutionary, is being able to think creatively vision, in a visionary manner uh, and tactically on your feet. How do, you, how do you get in, how do you get out? For example, when we took uh, Lincoln Hospital, we trained. People think that this was just a, some sort of a spontaneous event. It wasn't. We trained, we ran, had the guys, men and women run around uh, the Central Park Mirror uh, mm. in Harlem until mm. they could do it effortlessly. And the image that is indelible in my mind is one of the lords used to smoke a lot. He used to have a cigarette in his mouth and he used to do the whole, the whole slate with the cigarette in his mouth. We didn't care as long as he finished it. By the time we finished training them, also we were training karate because we wanted the cops to know that we, we didn't have guns, of course we did, um, but we were not gonna use them. I did not believe in taking out guns. We have an axiom in Harlem. Don't take out a, a piece unless you're gonna use it. And I- now, wait, you, you didn't, did, you didn't bring, did you bring guns into the hospital in the takeover? No, no, okay. no. In fact, I was upset when they brought guns into the second people's church. I was very upset about that. Okay. Um, you only bring guns when you have to do it. And if you bring guns, be prepared to use them, be adept at using them and shoot to kill. Don't play games. So we didn't have that. What happens? We trained, we trained, we trained. Uh, we had had meetings. There had been prior meetings before with the Health Revolutionary uh, Unity Movement, uh, the Coalition to Save Lincoln Hospital. All of these people had done the groundwork. And I want to commend them highly. Uh, Walter Bosque and uh, uh, several others were there. Ram Ramon Jimenez. Um, so many people had been there working for the Cleo Silver who had been working for this. When we decided to attack, we looked at the access routes, we looked at the, uh, the, the doors, we figured out it was 11 stories high, the nurse's residence. Um, we took it, Jim, we took it in seven minutes, an 11 wow. story high building, seven minutes. We got to the top and we secured it in 15. Uh, I don't think the United States Army would have been able to do better. So we were in great shape and we took it. Now, uh, of course, the cops came and they, uh, I had never seen a tank. I had never seen a New York City police tank, an army, an, uh, an army personnel carrier, APC. But they were out there. They had huge guns, huge rifles, rifles that could pierce three, foot, three feet of brick. So we were in danger. But as you, you said... As you said too, uh, Felipe, you you had the support of the community, yes, and you developed the support among the medical staff as yes. well, and the we workers did. at the hospital who are also the patients. Often they were the right. community members, and they they saw the justice of what you were doing. That can't be underemphasized. Um, there is no revolutionary consciousness without the community, without the people. I find that if you raise consciousness by doing radical acts, but not having a community base, you divorce yourself from the main stem of the people. The people have to be with you. They have to understand what's happening. They have to participate in it. So what we did is we made sure we, we did organizing um, in Spanish and in English so that people understood what we were doing. And even the nurses and the doctors supported us. In fact, the way we were able to escape after 12 hours, yeah. um, was that the nurses, someone suggested that we wear smocks. The nurses and doctors volunteered their smocks, their uh, physician's coats, their clipboards, and we walked out unscathed, thank God. Um, at, at the one exit here, that's an amazing scene. And and you and you, then you passed, you passed the very police who were coming in, who they found didn't know who nobody we were. there. That's right, they, they didn't know who we were. Uh, Brilliant. So we really get out of it. Brilliant. Now, the thing about this is that when you say courage, courage is not some man who has big pecs and huge biceps um, and is willing to do battle. Courage is overcoming your fear. That's what courage is. There's always fear. I'm afraid of people who don't have fear. I'm afraid of people who have uh, nothing to lose. I would much rather be with someone who does have something to lose and is willing to take a chance if it's going to succeed. I'm telling you, the men and women of the Young Lords, as I think back over 50 years, my God, they were inspired. They wanted, they were, they were ready to die. And we were ready to die that day, that day. And Young yet, people have an altruism that cannot, you can't, yeah. you can't buy it. Why do you think the United States Army and the Marine Corps and the SEALs look for young boys? Young boys, have, young men have this altruism. We had it. And since I was raised as a Christian uh, fundamentalist, if you will, 
if since I was raised in the church, I believe we were doing God's work. You did. I'll tell you, I'll tell you a little something. I was praying one day and um, I was concerned about uh, my, uh, my ideology. I'm very much a socialist, very much uh, gleaned on or weaned on Marxist Leninist theory and, uh, and Franz Fanon and Malcolm X and Albizu Campos and Che Guevara and Fidel and Kwame Nkrumah. And I'm into this stuff. And as I'm thinking about, my God, uh, am, I, am I losing God? Am I losing who you are? Am I divorcing myself from you? And I heard this voice. Could have been my head. Could have been my own ego. But it was, it was a different voice. It didn't have the tenor. It didn't have the, 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 the sonority. Uh, it didn't have the, the, the crackiness of my own voice. And it said basically this. Don't you know that everything you've done is something that I wanted you to do? Don't you know I've been at your side every minute of the day? Right. I have not forsaken you. And you, believe it or not, have not forsaken me. You're feeding the poor. You're clothing uh, the naked. You're yeah. um, taking care of the homeless. Are you kidding me? Taking over that hospital is what you had to do. This is God's work. With that, I knew that everything we had done was fine. But Felipe, you left on a couple of names in that list you just gave. But that may have just been inadvertent. Martin Luther King, Mahatma uh, Gandhi. Yes. Would you include? Now, that's. Absolutely. Not absolute nonviolent, if you will, civil disobedient. Let me correct you on something. Perhaps. Mahatma Gandhi was not against violence. He believed in righteous violence. He, he believed that there's a, a brand of Hinduism that believes in fighting for their rights. You don't just give up like that. He understood violence. He wasn't against, he wasn't non, he was nonviolent in the sense of going to attack people. But if attacked, he believed that you should fight. No, no, no. Uh, we have a wrong not, opinion about that. Well, Okay, you're you you're more of a scholar than I am on that. I, my understanding was he was nonviolent. Let's make he that was clear. nonviolent, he was and in the face of, for example, no, the brutal uh, beatings that the British uh, meted out to his people, they took it. They didn't fight back in that. No, that, that right. assault, but he, uh, there were people there. Um, who believed in fighting. And he said that there's okay. a time I wish I did. By the way, during the salt strike against the British, they were beaten pretty badly. Absolutely. And he continued his po uh, policy of nonviolence. Um, nonviolence is the most effective tool for um, promulgating a sort of resistance in people who have nothing to do with politics. However, there comes a point at which the nation state um, the oppressor crosses the line. And the question is right now, whether we have crossed the line in the United States of America. Yep. We've got to be very careful now because we can lose our democracy on this one. Yeah. If we continue to do the things that we're doing as a government, if we continue um, with the anti-Semitism, with the anti-Black, with the anti-Latino, and let me make this clear, though it's not been stated, Jimmy, they are very much afraid of Latinos because they're coming in swarms from the South. They've ignored them for years. They've colonized, they've exploited them uh, through corporations, uh, the American Fruit Corporation, the American, the Bananas, the uh, Honduras, the Del Monte and all of the others. They've exploited them. And now the, the, the roosters are coming, the, the, the flock is coming home. What do they call it? The, um, um, the chickens are coming home to roost. Come to roost. No, that's a great point. I mean, I think the fear of blacks also retaliating for what's been done to them. The uh, guilt. Your point is the well guilt. taken. No, your yeah. point is well taken. I think in a way, it, you know, Hispanic Latino people have taken more and more of that role as well. You can see it in the rhetoric. Yeah, it's it's over. And, and Fidel was the beginning of that. Of course, Simon Bolivar was. Of course, uh, to, uh, to, uh, Toussaint Louverture was and Dessalines. Um, but these days, we're looking at a situation where Mexicans um, are being exploited, humiliated, right, right on, in this community. Um, you see people working for, for less than minimum wage. Um, but they're coming here to provide a future for their children. Um, they're coming here to, to provide a new vision. Mexico, a lot of the people have lost their land. Hereditary land holdings, uh, you can't make any money if Monsanto is buying up all the corn seed. Right. And and giving up uh, and giving you modified corn rather than natural corn, 
you have 100 acres, you've been working it, or even 10 acres, you've been working it, and you go to sell it at market, the guy says, I'm sorry, you want too much for your corn. I can get it from Monsanto. Uh, they give it to me for nothing, almost. So you, you end up um, you end up coming here because there's nothing else. The land cannot provide you with a living. Um, and they will face, as they do in El Salvador, Honduras, Guatemala, they will face rape, murder, disease, crossings, uh, in, in, one, uh, in alligator infested waters, crocodile infested waters. They will do what they can for their future. Right. Uh, and so you have to give them credit. These are courageous people. And of course that DNA is in our blood as well. The courage, the courage of the young lords, just to get back to point, was that they were incensed. Youth has an incredible ability to feel to, for justice. I've never seen a more finite sense of justice among young people. They really understand what time it is. Um, and I think if our courts were people by young, young judges and young, young officers, we'd be in a better, better shape than we are now. You see that in the climate movement also as well. Um, in the what? Yes. In the climate yes. movement, the incredible yes. uh, youth involvement there, um, the sunrise movement and so on. Absolutely. Um, to make a little bit of a jump, and then getting back to the hospital, do you see, what, what do you see as you look out at the political landscape in New York City in terms of Latino Hispanic leaders? I don't see. Do you see something there in the city council? Uh, you know, who are the, the, the leaders, if any, that you look up to that you think haven't uh, become part of the establishment, haven't sold out? First, let me pre uh, preface this by saying running for office doesn't mean you've sold out. You have right. to I didn't mean that. I didn't mean right. that. Okay. Um, also, I don't see anything happening in the Puerto Rican community. There's been no vision. There have been no legislative initiatives. Um, there's been a lot of back and forth to Puerto Rico. They go to the Somos Uno conference and they exchange names, numbers, and bodies, from what I hear. Um, but nothing really, really effective. I haven't seen anything in this Puerto Rican community. In fact, we lament, those of us who've been in this movement for a long time and are Puerto Rican, lament the fact that we are not seen as anything in this city. We have no brand, if you will. We're not feared, we're not loved, we're nothing. We're, we're ciphers. Um, and that's unfortunate because we help build this city. Yeah. Um, we don't have, we do have people in office but they are people who uh, who are now in a in a comfortable position. Um, they're going to get. They're going to retire. They're going to have a, a, a an income. What do they call it? Um, uh, a retirement income um, in the excess of uh, five figures. They're going to do well, and so they don't worry. No one. They're, they're not being held accountable, and I think we need to hold them accountable. How about what? some of the younger ones? All right. I mean, even, look, the younger look, one, even the younger ones, even the younger ones have. Tiffany Caban, let me mention a couple. Tiffany Caban, Richie Torres, 15th con Congressional District, AOC. You see, not the, the only one of that group that I admire and respect is AOC. The yeah. others have made deals, whether they think it's wonderful or not, have made deals that are antithetical to our community, I think. Um, right. And I think no one has stood out and said, this is my, this is my community. You will, go, you will go this far and no further. Um, they're cute kids. Let me not say kids. They're cute. They're, 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 they're intelligent. They're articulate. But they're not meeting the needs of our people. We have a prison population that is beyond what we have as a, as a percentage of the population, what we represent as a percentage of the population. We have mental, mental illness. We have spousal abuse. It's becoming more and more prevalent as men lose their jobs and find themselves staying home a lot. We have a tremendous problem with education. Our education has, our kids are not graduating. And when they do graduate, they're not ready for college, Jim. We need to get them prepared. Education for me is the next revolutionary forefront. I think we need to really start working on that. That and crime. Do you, do you and, well, and jobs, um, but that jobs. leads tied into, do you see, any comments about the recent elections in Puerto Rico there? Puerto Rican, the Puerto Rican Independence Party, PIP. It hasn't done Citizens, well. Citizen Victory Movement. Yeah, it hasn't done well and it will never do well as long as they remain white and aloof. 
That is the problem with Pete. That has been the problem with many of the independentista organizations in Puerto Rico. And here's where we get into colorism. They have not been able to move beyond the college campus, the salons of intellect, and get into those communities like Luis Aldea, like uh, Barrio Obrero um, and Ponce and work at organizing black people. I don't understand it. Well, how can you expect um, people to uh, adhere to your ideological uh, wishes if you're not working with them, living with them, eating with them, dying with them if need be? I don't see it. William Barber, Poor People's Campaign, is he more? William aligned? Barber is more the answer. Is much There's more, more the, the answer. answer, right? Yeah. More the answer. I, I love him. I love what he says. He's an incredibly articulate man. But we have several people. We have some people may, uh, in the cloth who are trying. We have um, Sam Cruz, a great uh, theologian. He's out of uh, Union Theological Seminary, who has uh, a church in Sunset Park, who's very politically involved. We have Mark Rivera uh, from the uh, Primitive Church on East Broadway, who who's always involved in stuff. Um, we have loads of people who are in the church. Um, uh, Jonathan, uh, a friend of mine, Jonathan, who's a, who's a theological student and a, a major as a lawyer, is going to be a lawyer. Um, we have loads, uh, had Song and Liz Cologne and people who have, who want to make things happen. Um, and uh, we have Reverend um, uh, Rivera up in, uh, up in the Bronx um, on uh, Jerome Avenue. Okay. So there are people who are individual people who are trying their best to affect youth and affect quality of life, but they are few and far between and it's difficult in terms of money and time. But I think the church has an incredible role to play. The old so uh, Puerto Rican Socialist Party, I did a show. PSP. Uh, They're old. They, yeah, what, uh, now they've been out of real organizing for a while now, but what... Uh, what do you think their legacy is? I, I know I did the show. They have, a great, they have a great legacy. The problem. Yeah, and they did certainly uh, acknowledge the young lords. of. In a and, very, and I appreciate that. Admirable way, yes. But Jim, here's the problem. Yeah. You cannot talk to young people about revolution solely in terms of class. You've got to include race. You've got to include music. You've got to include um, education, you've got to include sex training, uh, uh, sex classes, everything. The, when we met PSP, when we met, uh, it started as MPI, became PSP, when we met them, they were well-meaning and they would come to our office and, but when the stuff began to hit the fan, they disappeared. They were not ready for direct confrontation and we had a problem with that. Speaking about a problem ad nauseum is not going to solve the problem. You have to reach out. You have to step out, step out of your of, of your privileged position, out of your cocoon. Um, we had a lot of what we call coconuts, brown on the outside, white on the inside. White meaning their, their attitudes were basically ugly American. So what difference did it make that they were socialists? What difference did it make that they wanted independence? Um, and to this day in Puerto Rico, it's happening. Though I will tell you this, more and more Puerto Ricans are identifying not as white, the latest census shows, but as people of mixed race, at least they're beginning to understand that they are not Europeans. And that's, that's important. many of them. Many of them still do. Many Puerto Ricans still identify as white. And this is a problem we're having. Um, it's been a problem. On the island and in the mainland. Yes. Both, both. Yes. You've hosted so many radio shows over the years. You really know your stuff on this. You're a musicologist. Um, what is the role of poetry, dance, music, and all this? Uh, we, we've shown clips, you know, of the documentary before and after we had you, the, our discussion here, and and there was music, there was joy, there was singing. Uh, that's so important, isn't that? Uh, isn't it for yes. revolutionary moving of movement and transformation, and getting people mobilized? I think. Art is the spear tip of revolution. Political movements, activist movements cannot move without raising consciousness. The one instrument you use to raise consciousness, you don't have to use it, it uses you actually, is art. If we're not producing movies, records, dances, sculpture, art, that 
edifies the conscience, edifies the human spirit, you're not going to have revolution. It's as simple as that. Um, my axiom for that is when the, when the United States government begins to arrest artists, you will know the revolution is in place, that, we are, that, that the counter-revolution is here, that fascism has taken over. In South America, the first people they arrest are the singers, the artists, the poets, that's who they arrest. Yeah. We need to, we need to understand that. Amiri Baraka, who was a nationalist, black nationalist, and eventually became a communist, said that there is no revolution without art. There's no black art is where it's at. You need to make your poems bullets. You need to make your music responsive to the needs of a people. And as Bobby Seale told me one time, you need to take scientific socialism and apply it to the objective conditions of your community. That's what it's all about. I'm a poet. Um, and the poems that I have speak to the ethos, the pathos of my people. I walk to El Barrio and I still cringe at some of the things I see. It's not, we have an enormous amount of, we've had recently a spate of killings. Uh, the other day on 102nd Street, between 102nd and 103rd, um, 101st and 102nd and 2nd Avenue, um, a kid went in and they sell Lucy's. It's these, uh, I think they're, um, they're from um, Yemen. They sell Lucy's and the guy wanted a 50 cent credit. He didn't get any shot, you know, he shot the guy. I mean, this is stuff we have to, we have to work on our children. This is crazy that eventually they caught him, I think. But violence among youth is rapidly becoming the norm. Um, they've been cooped up too long. They have no alternatives. They have no other outlets. I wish, I asked God, if I ever became a multimillionaire, or when I become a multimillionaire, I'm gonna make sure that I get these kids out of here. Travel is absolutely crucial. Um, we have places like Montana. You wanna be a cowboy? You can be one in Montana, Wyoming. There are places and land that's available. Now what we're gonna to have to fight is white skin privilege where these guys don't want any people of color around them. But I think we have the land, we have the people who want it to happen. Uh, we've got to export our kids. I hate to say this, right. but we've got, we've got to tell our kids, go east, young man. Go to Japan, go to China, go to India. Find out what other people are doing and living like. And then and, come and back. bring back that knowledge Yes, to the, or or settle there if they wish as well. Or settle there. It's up Whatever. to you. But I I I had a I had, I was talking to a corrections uh, uh, expert, and I said, what if instead of giving African countries the um, money f for them to corrupt each other with, why not send some of our inmates there? Why don't we tell the, the guys, you have committed murder three times. We're going to send you to Mozambique. We're going to send you to Angola. We're going to send you to Tanzania. And there you will have to live and work with elders. We will give the elders whatever monies we spend on you, especially kids, not hardened criminals. I'm sorry. Um, these kids need to be reformed. They need to find out something else and discover themselves. Um, and make sure they don't come back until A, they've learned and they have a rudimentary knowledge of the, of the, of the, of the, of the culture, a rudimentary language skill. They, if they marry, they marry there. Um, and they've contributed something to society. They've learned a skill. Why not take them? We spend $100,000 on each of these little inmates, teenage inmates. Why not give it to that country? We know they're going to rob $50,000 of it. But if $50,000 can be used to educate this kid, by all means. And then have them come back after five, six, seven, even 10 years. Uh, and if, they, if they've reformed, they can come back to American society. Right now we have Eric Adams, uh, who's the mayor of New York. I do not envy his position. I will help him in whatever way I can. But I'm telling you, he is facing a gargantuan task of getting not only white New Yorkers to understand um, that it is in their interest, not only to be diverse, but to be inclusive. But he's got to fight his own people. He's got to work with his own people who are demanding that people not go to jail. And the other half want them to go to jail and want them to go to jail protected. and want them to be punished. So punished. this is going to be a difficult task. He believes he says he's going to do stop. He told me on my program he wants to stop first. But question, is that going to work? He has an ins almost insurmountable task. I admire him. Um, wow. And rather than say he doesn't belong there. Uh, as some, some, one of the people I love very much said, he doesn't belong there. Um, he is against so much of the, so many of the progressive policies. 
I say, let him be. Let's see what we can do. This is a new okay. Thing. All right. Well, well, this is, as you know, I I just did a program with Cornell. A couple other people on on stop. Oh, I would trip. I would have. Why didn't you invite me? Well, this was just for this one event that we were in. We'll, we this is the tenth anniversary. We're all doing anniversaries. I love Cornell. I have not we been know. able to contact him. He's so busy. I need to talk to him. I want to talk to Eric Dice, and I want him on my I, radio program. I understand. Well, oh, tell. Well, we are against stop and frisk. Let me get that in there. We we yeah. fought and we went through it. I know. And so, on. but here's the point. Tell us. We're over time. Almost over time. Tell us, and we're going to get together. Person, we're going to discuss a lot of this. No, we got it. We got to sit we down. We got to get together. Yeah. Tell us you about your radio program yeah. uh, and, it's and called, how to get in touch with you. Okay, it's called Latin Roots, and right. it's anthological. It's a uh, a retrospective study of Latin music, starting with Roma, starting with Africa to the Caribbean, and then to the United States. Um, we play dance music. We play holy music. We play. Um, folkloric music. It's called Latin Roots. I've had it since WRVR uh, in the 80s, in the yeah. 70s, was it? Yeah, in the 70s. Um, and it, it's, it's just a wonderful program. My son and I produce it. He is brilliant. <laughs> I don't know how he's picked up all this stuff, but he's brilliant at history and at sound. What, when is, when's it on? When's it on? Saturdays from 2 to 4. On, on BAI? On BAI, 2 to 4 p.m. I also have a program called What's Going On? a one hour call in program where we can discuss anything we want uh, for, uh, on WBIs, but it's seven to eight in the morning, an ungodly hour, but it is, I, really I realize right, people man. are picking up on it. Well, look, we, we have a podcast with Manny Gomez. I, we will, we will interchange information. You got to have Manny on too. He's, oh no, I want you on. In fact, well, we're gonna, listen, we got a lot to talk about and, Love to your incredible family. I, Thank you I've so seen, much. I've not met your 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 sons and daughter. They are incredibly good looking. I'm blessed. I'm blessed. Forever, a lot, forever young, as you are. You look fabulous. I sound Thank like you, that guy. But you look fat. But you don't. You look terrific. You look healthy. This show will be on a few days before your birthday, November twenty yes. fourth. Happy birthday. My thank you. A couple months later, we are over time. Felipe, thank you. Besos so much. y abrazos, my brother. Hugs and kisses. Lachaim. May you, may you, may you live long and prosper. Lachaim. And humor, Jewish humor. And humor. We humor. need that too. Amen. Amen. Thank you so very much for watching us here on the Radical Imagination. This is Jim Vredos. We'll see you again next week on the Radical Imagination. We wanted a revolutionary change to the health system in this country, and we still do. There may not be a Young Lords right now, or there may not be a Black Panther Party, but guess what? A lot of us are not dead, and we're communicating this to a young generation that's going to carry that struggle forward. Healthcare was never a consideration for poor people. Is something that we fought for, poor people fought for, throughout U.S. history. Healthcare is a bigger issue today than it was back then. The issue hasn't changed. Fundamentally, I am a revolutionary, and I believe in dressing nice. I believe in vacations, and you know, I believe in taking care of your children and buying houses. Revolution has nothing to do with that. Revolution is a desire to change the class, the caste, and race system of the United States of America. That's what it's about. And here we are 50 years later talking about the Young Laws. What it says is that a good act can never be erased. A revolutionary act cannot be erased. They captured the heart of the people to be moved to the streets. And change doesn't happen if you don't have people on the streets.